Hey everybody, uh, it's Dr. Missy's medical school. This is class number seven. I know I told you I was gonna do class number five about how to wear a mask, but something came to me last night. <clears throat> Again, a night that I wasn't sleeping well and it just made a really big difference to me. So I thought I'd share that with you today instead. Uh, you know, all the news uh, globally is coming to us very rapidly, and um, so is my reaction to that news, as I'm sure yours is too. So anyway, not to make lightly of this, but we're going to talk about phlegm. Phlegm is that stuff that you cough up from your lungs. Some people call it sputum, phlegm, um, lugi. It, please forgive my cough drop, but... <clears throat> I'll cough a lot if I don't have a cough drop. My voice is uh, almost laryngitis, and I think it's because I've coughed so much that my vocal cords aren't real happy with me. So anyway, I was thinking it might be time to record a song because I might sound pretty sexy with this raspy voice. Um, but first this. So how to cough up gobs of phlegm is the title of this particular class. <clears throat> Did you hear that? It's kind of dry. I wanted to make sure my cough was pretty dry before I did this for you so I could prove my point. Hopefully I won't get proved wrong. Um, or we can also call it the phlegm gym. You know, like gym, lifting weights. This is called the phlegm gym. <laughs> G-Y-M. Anyway, um, I'm pretty overwhelmed by all of this. I know y'all are too. That's why we've made a connection, you know. Um, I feel helpless. You feel helpless. Everybody in the world feels helpless, and it's a pretty natural thing, pretty devastating on our emotions. I'm going to try not to cry this time. But I would like to thank... Uh, several friends from reaching out. These are folks, some I do know and some I've never met before in my life, but now we're Facebook friends because of the videos that I've shared, which gives me hope that the message that I have that I think is very valid um, is being shared with people from, I wrote it down, <coughs> Italy, Germany, Kenya, Scotland, the UK, uh, India. I got some friends from India today. So anyway, those are new friends and I'm grateful for that and that they can share with their family and friends. And, you know, sometimes social media is bad and sometimes it's amazingly good. And maybe this time it will be really good for the globe because there's no way I could have gotten this message to somebody from Kenya or India in our old system of not having the internet. So <clears throat> for starters, I'm not your doctor. Um, I know a lot of you have started asking me questions and advice and stuff like that and I appreciate the fact that my name is Dr. Missy Chamberlain. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I got an engineering degree from Columbia University in New York City in 1984. I got my medical school degree, my MD, from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia in 1988. And then I attended six years of orthopedic surgery under the direction of Dr. Lamar Fleming from 1988 to 1994. Also during that time in 1987, I married my husband. Um, in 1980s, I'm sorry, between 1984 and 1994 and all that time for um, medical school and residency, I married my husband, Phil Chamberlain. He's the guy you've been seeing doing the cupping technique or the uh, lung drum, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we had our daughter in 1992 during my orthopedic residency. And I set up my practice in Colorado, Gunnison, Crested Butte, Colorado, a solo practice for sports medicine and arthroscopy and trauma care. 
for the residents there for the Western State College and uh, Western State uh, Colorado University is what it's called now, as well as Crested Butte Mountain Resort, CBMR. So I took care of a lot of sports injuries. Um, so that's another point I want to make is I'm not a pulmonologist. A pulmonologist is a doctor who specializes in the lungs. So this is all, everything I'm giving you is my opinion. I have not been tested for COVID-19 yet. Uh, my husband went to see how the lines were. They were really rather long the other day. And, um, you know, I always talk about gross stuff. So I'm going to talk about gross stuff now too. I don't touch your face, Missy. Anyway, I was having diarrhea and I just didn't think I could sit in the car for two or three hours waiting for a test to be done. So since I'm having my symptoms and they're so classic to what everyone else is having, um, my presumptive diagnosis for myself is COVID-19. Also for my husband, COVID-19. His response to the illness has not been quite as dramatic, although today my day was better than his day. His day was worse. He's feeling really tired. A lot of his symptoms are actually dizziness. So I think uh, dehydration is a big concern for him. I keep having him pound water and coffee, but it's, it's pretty hard to keep up. He's not having fevers at all. I went up to 100.2, I believe it was, at my worst. Uh, the highest I've had today is 98.9. Um, anyway, I make all that point about I'm not your doctor, I'm not a pulmonologist. This is only my opinion because, you know, <clears throat> you know about armchair athletes where you're sitting there watching Monday Night Football and you're telling the referees what to do and the athletes what to do and stuff. I feel like in some ways I'm an armchair pulmonologist and I don't mean to discount or discredit them in any way, shape or form. They're out there in the trenches working on all this and I'm just concerned that some of the basic fundamentals of pulmonology that I learned as a medical student and intern and then I haven't had much exposure to it um, are being overlooked uh, regarding telling the consumer the patient population, all of you guys out there that haven't gone to the hospital yet and hopefully never will have to. And so it was just my goal to try to get that message out. I'm afraid that they've been so overwhelmed with the severity of this uh, respiratory disease in patients with COVID-19 in the more severe cases that there's so much focus on the ventilators and the lack of ventilators and what kind of medicine might reverse it and this, that, and the other that I just don't hear any talk in the media, television, task force. I just don't hear talk of any of that regarding uh, pulmonary toilet, uh, postural drainage, breathing exercises to help you express the phlegm, go to the phlegm gym, right? So that's my purpose here. Um, I'm always worried about offending people. Um, please know that in my heart, everything I'm doing here is in an effort to try to help. I feel like I have information, uh, fundamental information on the medical side, but just because it's fundamental on a medical side doesn't mean the general public knows it. Just like you guys, you know, are lawyers or construction guys and hairdressers. I mean, there's just so many things I have no idea about. Obviously, I'm not a hairdresser. I did that myself, but it's pretty easy with the little machine, you know? Anyway, <clears throat> this is my common sense to avoid a ventilator and to avoid death for you, family members, friends, and anybody you can spread the message to around the world. I really appreciate if you would share this. The other thing is I want to tell you is I remember medical school, everything was very overwhelming, it was very new. It seemed like every word they were using I'd never heard before. And so I'd have to read and reread, watch and rewatch things a lot to really get them learned. So, 
if you have to rewatch these videos a few times, put some headsets on, get in a quiet place, make sure you've had plenty of sleep. It's kind of a dry subject. <laughs> Actually, it's a wet subject, but that's uh, a bad medical joke, isn't it? Okay. Medical humor can be really disgusting. <clears throat> so the phlegm gym, or how to cough up gobs of phlegm, are used, in my opinion, if you have a dry cough, if you have underlying medical conditions, such as you're on chemotherapy and a dry cough, you're on oxygen and a dry cough, COPD and a dry cough, or somebody like the rest of us, like myself, you go from a wet cough to a dry cough, and you realize that, man, maybe I have some mucus plugs in there that I gotta get out. I gotta get some of that sputum out of there because apparently my, my windpipe here has gotten very dry. I'm not even coughing any of that wetness up anymore. And that can lead to the air sacs getting filled with fluid, white blood cells, COVID-19 virus, and uh, cause it that the air that's coming in and it's supposed to go down in those little air sacs and get oxygen into the blood, it doesn't happen. And that's why a lot of those folks are having heart attacks. If you don't get oxygen for long enough and it gets low enough, your heart uh, fails, things like that. So that's why a lot of those folks are having heart attacks. It's not necessarily that. This is my opinion. It's not necessarily that they had heart disease, although some probably did. Um, but if you if you if you try to operate a body without any oxygen, you get multi system failure. The heart will fail. The brain will fail. The liver will fail. The kidneys will fail. Everything has to be oxygenated. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> moisture is a big thing. Um, for the phlegm to come back out, remember I told you there were those uh, along the bron uh, main bronchus and the little bronchial tubes that go out to the alveoli? There are those little hair cells that wiggle and they move debris and bad things. And then there's the globular cells that if the hair's not working real efficiently, it'll get a message that it needs to produce sputum. And so now you've got the hair moving and the sputum, and it can get kind of sludgy. I have noticed that my cough doesn't seem to be, I'm on day 15. My cough does not seem to be uh, loose and liquidy. My cough seems to, it's not chunky. I know that's really gross, but it ain't exactly clear, okay? So anyway, that's got to be harder for this to go by and for the mucus to go by. Now, I did start the Mucinex DM. So that's a guanifacine with dextromethorphan. Guanifacine is uh, to make your mucous membranes throughout your body, especially the lungs, really more like water, liquidy, so that the mucus flows by real quick and it moves the debris away quicker instead of being all sludgy. So that's the role of the Mucinex. Another company is called Robitussin. They make a Robitussin DM. The DM is the dextromethorphan. That is actually a cough suppressant. It's debatable as to whether or not to use it right away. You could just go with the Mucinex or Robitussin and you could get it in a liquid form or in a delayed release tablet form. Although the delayed release tablet form is really large like a horse pill, I like it better because then I only have to remember twice a day to take it. And it doesn't put a bad taste in my mouth even though it's hard to swallow. It's worth it. So that's what I use. Um, the benefit of having the uh, cough suppressant is you can actually get a little sleep at night because if your cough is not suppressed, all of this stuff going on, it's really very irritating. And the fact that you've coughed a lot when things are dry, everything's quite scratchy. You know how that is when you have a cold or a flu. There's a whole lot of coughing going on. 
not a whole lot of shaking going on, a whole lot of coughing going on. But anyway, the coughing is <clears throat> nice not to have that for some hours at night. So I had chosen for myself to use the combined Mucinex DM, but you could do Robitussin DM or you could do the plain variety, whatever you want to do. I didn't start it until I think it was day 12 because remember I told you in one of the last videos that I was concerned to take anything. The press on this is, it's confusing. You would think naturally that ibuprofen's good for pain and body aches and stuff. And then they were like, no, no, don't take that. You want to have the inflammatory response. The immunocompromised can't make an inflammatory response. And that's why they're doing so poorly. And you get a cytokine storm and blah, blah. There's just all sorts of confusing information. So I decided I wasn't going to take anything at all. So anyway, on day 12, uh, I had the mucus plugs uh, when my temperature shot up and I really went to a very dry cough suddenly after a very voluminous cough. And so, dang it, I'm touching my face again. Um, let's see, I lost my track of thought. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, I go back here. Uh, there's several ways of getting moisture. One is the Mucinex and Robitussin. I, I highly recommend that. That's worked for me. The other is hot steam. And it's not going to throw a bunch of fluid in your lungs and make your lungs collect with a bunch of water. That's different than those globular cells, okay? <clears throat> the hot steam is going to put some natural moisture on your vocal cords, down in your trachea, down in your bronchus, your, your uh, right main bronchus, your left main bronchus. And so I will often, you know, drink a lot of this water with, um, and sit in the bathroom. I just sit on the toilet seat there because that's the only chair in there, really. I sit on the toilet seat and I run the shower on really hot, hot, hot. I shut the door. I don't have little kids that'll come around and get burnt on that scalding water. But it, it billows with a very hot, steamy, moisture-rich environment. It gets the mirrors all fogged up. And I can feel it. You know, it feels like thick air. And that, that kind of starts to break things loose and get things going. So that's a really helpful way to moisturize the air canals as well. Um, I was looking at the side effects, the potential negative side effects for Mucinex and Robitussin. And the guanfacine. It really requires a high volume of water, and you'll see that I'm always drinking water, and I drink it to the point that my urine is quite clear. It's not clear water, but it's not deep yellow. Uh, they say that Mucinex and Robitussin, these tablets, delayed release tablets, can cause an increased risk of getting kidney stones, and they do recommend and talk a lot about staying well, well hydrated. So you got th you got three moisture things going on here. You've got the mucinex that's making the, the mucus uh, more fluid. You've got a ton of water that you're drinking to make your urine a light colored yellow. And that'll give you an idea of, you know, you're well hydrated. Problem there is you have to get up and pee a lot, which is a bummer when you're feeling tired. But it is what it is. And we're going to do this so we can get through it. And then the hot steam, okay? Another way to do hot steam, my mom used to do for me, you can get Vicks Vapor Rub and just put like a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon into a pot of boiling water. And then you can put a towel over your head and just breathe that steam in. Initially, it's really painful. You can't do it on the really hot boiling water, but you can actually get yourself a little mini steam thing going there. And that works really well too. I remember doing that as a kid. I don't have Vicks uh, Vapor Rub here. I feel like I've asked my kids for a lot. You know, they've gone out for medicines, they've gone out for groceries, and it's not something we have to do. So, um, but that's something if you don't have a shower and um, it, you just want to do the pot of hot water, it's uh, something you can do for your kids too. You could put it in a really stable, you could cook it on the pot, and then of course the pot's hot. And you could pour it into a really stable bowl and sit there with your child and hold the bowl and kind of get under the tent with them and make it sort of a fun 
uh, escape under a tent. And you'll hear them. They'll start rumbling in their, in their throat and start coughing up phlegm. And this, that's another way to go to the phlegm gym, okay? So anyway, I <clears throat> was racking my brain last night because I'm an overthinker, a worrier. It's not a good way to be, but it's the way I am. Um, oh, the other thing is mucinex and robitussin cause a lot of constipation. So therefore, you could then get hemorrhoids and da-da-da-da-da. So drink a ton of water to the point that your urine is pretty clear and you're not going to run into kidney stones or major constipation issues unless you've had them before or you have some other medical things, in my opinion. It's just my opinion. Please don't be mad at me if anything goes wrong. I think I'm doing the right thing here. I really do. Okay, so this is the exercise I thought to do. I practiced a couple of different breathing exercises to see which one would make me cough sputum the best over a long period of time, and I came up with this particular technique. This is the one that makes you cough gobs of sputum. And in that experiment I did, I actually coughed 32 times. Well, I coughed more than 32 times, but I touched my face again. 32 times I coughed up sputum. And 32 times it doesn't, you know, the, <clears throat> there's the esophagus in front of it. There's the trachea. Then there's the epiglottis, and the epiglottis comes down and it shuts down on the trachea when you're swallowing. Uh, yeah, it shuts down on the trachea when you're swallowing. I'm sorry, I meant to say the esophagus is back here, the trachea is more forward. The epiglottis comes crashing down on the trachea to shut it off uh, so that when you swallow water or food, it goes back through the uh, mouth, back into the esophagus. You know how sometimes you choke on water? It's because this guy was up a little bit and a drop or two got down your windpipe. So, anyway, um, because I coughed up 32 episodes of sputum and swallowed in 10 minutes time, even if you just cough up a little bit, multiply that by 32, my stomach saw a lot of sputum, because it's not like coming out into a, a rag, which would be nice. It's not doing that. It's staying pretty far back, so I have to swallow it. It's not ideal, but it's it's just the way it is for me. That's the way it's been. So anyway, you swallow that 32 times. About an hour later, you're nauseated. Um, I think that that sputum, that phlegm, has fluid from your body in it. It has white blood cells that were trying to fight off what was going on. It has COVID-19 virus in it. It just has a lot of nasty stuff in it. And your stomach doesn't like that. Your stomach has never considered that a meal before. So I get pretty nauseated. Uh, in the past 15 days, I have had four separate episodes of vomiting. Uh, it just came on as a kind of as a wave where I felt pretty nauseated. It did come on after the whole sputum swallowing thing. And I think it's just related to that. I don't necessarily think people have a vomiting, but I think it's secondary to the fact that you have a lot of sputum and you're swallowing a lot of sputum. Same thing with the nausea. I don't think you have a lot of nausea necessarily, in my experience. I don't have nausea unless I've just gone through an episode where I've swallowed a lot of sputum. And then I am, because... It's not exactly the meal that my stomach would order at a restaurant. Okay, so I've explained that. Now we're going to get into the, the bulk of this. So I'll put it on the main thing, that the breathing exercise that I'm trying to explain here on how to cough up gobs of phlegm is at uh, 25 minutes, okay? We're at 24 and a half. I have no idea how long this is going to go, but I am just going to give you everything I can give you, okay? Before I get into the breathing, no, nope, let me do the breathing exercise. So the breathing exercise is intended for somebody who's not too demented. They have an adequate IQ. They're not too young to understand. They can actually understand instructions. And basically, you have to breathe out all the way. Every molecule you can breathe out. 
Then you breathe in all the way through that small lip like you have a straw on your lips until you fully inflate your lungs. And that means you go, 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 breathe in, breathe in until you cannot do one more anything. You're done. At that point, you want to start coughing, not just once. You want to cough and cough and cough and wheeze and cough and cough and cough and wheeze and wheeze and wheeze and wheeze and wheeze and wheeze. Keep breathing out until there's not one more molecule of air in your lungs. At that point, you'll probably be bright red. You're going to see me. I'm going to look pretty crazy, scary. Don't be scared if you get scared about looking at stuff like this. Now's the time to go to another section of the video because this is going to look scary for about a minute, okay? If you don't have good lung capacity, I don't want you to do this to the point that you pass out. So you go to the point that you can, but if you're a pretty healthy person and you want to get over this the best, go to the last molecule of air comes out, okay? Then take a big deep breath in and then start coughing. Cough, 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 cough until the last little thing goes out, okay? So just to wrap it up one more time, you're going to breathe out all the way, number one. You're going to breathe in through a straw hole in your lips, nice and slow, but all the way to the top, 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 right? To the top. Fully inflate your lungs. And number three, you're going to cough repetitively. Wheeze. Cough some more. Cough some more. Cough some more. Cough some more. You might cough 30 times until you actually are red in the face and there's no more air in your body. At that point, <laughs> it's going to hit the fan. The phlegm's going to hit the fan, okay? Uh, don't worry, it doesn't come out as an expression. So the lung drumming, the percussion, the cupping, is still a really nice technique. Yes, you can do this particular breathing technique by yourself. If you're in a situation and you don't have help and you can't get your lungs drummed, nobody can do the cupping, then go ahead and do these breathing things. They're going to clear up a lot of phlegm. And the more phlegm you have out, the more air can get in. The more air can get in, the better your heart's going to do, the better your lungs are going to do. You're not going to panic as much. You're not going to feel so sick. It's really good. So now I want to show you. This is a CAT scan of a normal chest, okay? So normally in the chest, this is a front view of a chest. So these black areas, that's the lungs. This is the left lung, and this is the right lung because the patient is kind of like I am here, facing you, okay? This here's the heart. Right up here, this white thing coming across there, that's the person's neck. And see their windpipe? There's air. See that black thing right there? There's air in their windpipe. Here's their shoulder. And above their shoulder, beside their neck, there's air. So air should look white. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's totally wrong. Air should look black. Okay? So these are real healthy lungs. So you're probably wondering, but what are all these white spots? Well, in this CAT scan... It's clear to me that they put an IV in the person and they injected some dye so they could see the dye is showing up in the arteries and the veins here, okay? So all these little, remember I told you there's all these little branches? That's what you're seeing. That's, that's the blood vessels, okay? And you can see the big ones coming off the heart. Those are blood vessels. The dye is in the blood vessels, okay? So that's a normal lung. That's kind of our goal. We want to get back to this. I'm going to leave that right here for a second. We really want to get back to that. You study that. See, you got two lungs there. You got a windpipe coming down in. Those are just the blood vessels, those white spots. Those are not tumors. That's not fluid. 
Now on the right lung, it looks like 100% of that lung's working. It doesn't look like there's any big patches of white or fluid in there. Remember, the blood looks bright white. Fluid and muscles and stuff look kind of grayish in color. See, these are muscles, fat and muscles, okay? That's gonna look kind of grayish. Bones look pretty white, except like the marrow looks a little dark. But anyway, the, the heart has got some fat around it. Um, but basically it's got nice, rich blood, so it shows up white. So this is the look of a normal CAT scan with arthrogram, the dye study, of a normal chest x-ray. <clears throat> and this here is COVID, COVID-19. Look at that. Isn't that frightening? So this image is also a CAT scan. It's also done with dye. See the dye right there and here? So this part of the lung is working okay. Down here, it's working okay. Way up here, it's working okay. Over here, it's working okay. But I would say about 60% of this side and one third of this side is entirely consumed by something the color of bone, fluid. Remember, we talked about fluid. So this, this person here is drowning in their own fluid. There's no way they could breathe normally with that. And somehow we gotta figure out, is there a way to cough that out? I don't think your lungs look like that yet. I don't think my lungs look like that yet. I don't wanna let them get there. That's probably the look of a lung that needs a ventilator. And maybe that's the look of a lung that's gonna die. And we do not want that. We don't want fluid on our lungs. Our lungs were intended to be airy and we're getting them back to that, okay? So that's the COVID-19 lung. Bilateral, meaning both lungs have infiltrates, which means it's infiltrated or attacked by COVID-19. So we, you know you got the virus all through both sides and then you got the reaction to that, the fluid, the white blood cells, all the reaction. So basically the alveoli in those areas, the little air sacs are not getting proper air exchange and the blood is coming through to try to get oxygenated and it's just marching on through. It's not able to get any oxygen because there's no oxygen in the sacs. The sacs are filled with crap. The sacs are filled with phlegm and mucus and sputum and we need that guy back. All right, so I'm gonna do it. And uh, what else can I tell you? <clears throat> I think that's all I can tell you. So you're, you're about to see the episode. Um, you're welcome to watch for the next 10 minutes. There may be times where I'm just staring at you or just talking, but you can start to count the number of times I cough. And if I produce sputum, I'm gonna give you a thumbs up. And so you can start to count how many times my thumb goes up and you'll know how much of that got cleared out. Now, I think that you might clear some out, but it keeps producing. So at some point, we're gonna reach the tipping point where we're clearing it out. It's no longer able to produce. So, oh, this is something I wanted to tell you. This was another epiphany that came to me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just a thinker and I worry so much. I've never had a concern about the whole planet going to shit. Sorry, kids. That's my only bad word and I won't use another one, okay? Anyway. They said that this virus can live on metal, plastic, and hard surfaces for three days, 72 hours. Um when they're making vaccines and stuff, and you look at all those little test tubes and those little jiggly machines, they're clearly doing something with the virus in water. Virus in water lives a long time so they can test it. 
We don't want our virus in water. We can let the virus be in the water in the lab, not in us, okay? So it lives uh, three days on hard surfaces. It, I think they said it lives one day on cardboard, uh, maybe one day on clothing, and 30 minutes in the air. So guess what? If we made this all air, how long do you think the virus would live in us? Not very long. Apparently it doesn't like an air environment. It likes hard surfaces and it likes liquids. So that was another point I had. All right, here we go. Breathe out all the way. Breathe in through a straw mouth. Cough repetitively until you can't breathe out anymore. And at the very, very end, and this is the hardest part, your face is going to turn red. It's going to look like, oh, God, is she ever going to take a breath? Don't worry, I will. I'm, when I sense the fact that I really need to take a breath in, I will. And I'm not asking you if you're on oxygen or have major COPD or major pulmonary issues to, to pass out. Please don't, okay? You know what your limits are. I'm not there with you. I'm not your doctor. This is my opinion. I'm here to help you, okay? So here we go. have to wait and the cough will start to come okay um let me see what else can i tell you <clears throat> so my temperature at the most was 98 degrees today um i have had a recent dry cough <clears throat> i do continue to do my breathing exercises just to get deep because i want to kind of open those areas that i've just kind of freed up a little bit and let that happen. So I go. like a lot there. <coughs> yeah. When I do cough, when I feel the tickle come on, wherever it's coming on in my breathing cycle, I go ahead and take, a, I want to get a deep breath in before I first initiate my cough because I want that cough to be strong. If I cough right at the end of my breathing, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a powerful cough. It'd just be like a <laughs> there wouldn't be much air in me. So I take a deep breath and I really cough it up. <coughs> Remember I've had a dry cough for about an hour. I waited specifically for you guys. This is clearly a wet cough, and I did that just by one, two, three. Whew. It's about a 10 minute thing. I do get sweaty.
Remember when you were in gym class or playing basketball or running track? It helps to expand your lungs by putting your hands behind your head. <coughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It's like a threesome. <coughs> oh, God, it's disgusting. So I'm having a lovely phlegm dinner at the phlegm gym. <coughs> God, that's bad. Okay, well, that's another good one. <coughs> Not so much. I rushed it. I sh should have waited until I really experienced the need to cough. So here we go. God, I hope that wasn't a piece of my lung. I'm just kidding. That was a medical joke. <laughs> to all my friends that know me, I have a terrible sense of humor. To those of you who don't, please forgive me. You'll get to know me soon enough. All right, so I haven't coughed there. Remember, I was just talking to you. I haven't coughed. But I had a number of very productive coughs. But I keep doing that breathing exercise because it takes, like I said, it takes about 10 minutes for it to really clear out. And it's when you really get those alveoli, the air sacs expanded because you've breathed in all the way, that's what triggers the cough again. Because we're clearing out this rascal. Remember, we're clearing that stuff out. We're coughing up white, not black. We're leaving the black behind, okay? <coughs> that was a good one. Come on, Gibson. You can come up here. Come on. It's okay. takes about 10 minutes. So you can do this entire exercise in about 10 minutes. Get rid of the sputum all on your own. You're not too sick. Maybe somebody went running to the grocery store and you feel like you need your chest pounded. Do this instead. It's really clearing out that stuff, okay? <coughs> Ooh, that was a big one. God, that's so gross. Anyway, um, I keep doing this. I keep doing it until I can breathe in and out about five or six times, and I'm just clear. And I mean, literally, I, I'm sure I'm not this clear. I'm sure I'm not this clear, but I'm way better than I was. And you just do that. So if this is going to take 10 minutes to clear your lungs out, and you're able to do it by yourself, don't you think people could help themselves? I, I just wish they would talk about this on the news. It just seems silly. There's 300 million people in our country, and I'm not sure how many billion people across the world. Is it 8 billion? Anyway, it's a tremendous number of people. We could all be doing this. There's just so many people dying, and I'm, I'm wanting to help, okay? <clears throat> so I, I haven't gone through those exercises where I'm breathing, so let's try that. Trying to get through five or six without. <coughs> <coughs> without coughing. That's not five or six, that was two. <coughs> My throat feels scratchy. Have some water with you when you do this. This is a good one. I'm getting a lot up. 
this may take 30 minutes. I'm going to keep recording. You're welcome to leave. I don't, you know, I mean, who, who should have to watch someone else do this? Whoever's doing it, you're a glutton for punishment. <coughs> no, I forced that one. The last one I had, but then this one was dry. Here we go. Also, if you lean back, you know, lean back like this, you're really opening up where your diaphragm is that skinny little muscle that... <coughs> God, I hate swallowing that. Okay. So if this on average takes, uh, God, I'm sweating, 10 to 15 minutes to do, um, you could do it every half hour, but then you wouldn't do anything else in your life. That seems unfair unless you're really struggling. Then go ahead and do that other exercise. You would start over. Remember, let's say we're going to start over. Let's pretend like I was all clear. I'd start over. I'd breathe out all the way. It's going to start another cycle with your breathing. And again, when you get about five or ten breaths in, and not scratchy breaths, you want them well hydrated, okay? If you get five or ten breaths in, oh, it feels so good, man. There's no pain. There's no pain in where I'm not having chest pain. Yeah, I was short of breath, but I kind of put that on myself. But if you have shortness of breath or you have chest pain, go to the hospital, call your doctor. I'm not your doctor. And I, I'm a little nervous. Some of y'all are trying to get advice from me at 1.30 in the morning, and it may be urgent advice. And this is me just trying to provide information, okay? <coughs> Ugh. <coughs> so again, I, you know, I may be here another five or ten minutes, and I'm okay with that. This is an investment in my life. And, you know, ventilators are not without potential problems. Ventilators, um, it's a machine that pushes air into your lung. And uh, there's something called ventilator lung for a reason. Um, if you're on a ventilator for a long time, it can cause scarring. And they're showing that if you leave this in your lungs for a long time, it can cause permanent scarring, which would turn you from an athlete into a very sedentary person if you didn't have good lung capacity. So even the young people, super important. Okay, guys? Super important. Um, so that was Dr. Missy's Phlegm Gym, class number seven, Phlegm Gym, how to cough up gobs of phlegm. I hope I've helped you. I know it's an inc <coughs> <coughs> oh 
Oh, God. An incredibly long video. This is a very effective technique to do by yourself. You may not be able to teach a two-year-old to do it. They may be more of this. But you can teach them to do some. And I'm going to try to think about how to make a two-year-old breathe deeper in. Or cough all the way out is the big thing. To cough all the way out is... Uh, it's going to be hard to teach a person who's demented or has a very, very low IQ or is just too young to understand what you're asking them to do. But I think if you model it and do it right along with them, we'll have the best chance of you being able to do it with your children. Because I would think back, my three-year-old, my four-year-old, my five-year-old, they're, they're definitely able to do this. They may not be able to go all the way out, but I bet I bet you they can. I bet you they can. It'll certainly make a difference. Oh, I feel another one coming on. Here we go. Deep breath in so I get that full force to speed them out. Okay, here we go. <coughs> Very good. Happy Saturday at the Flim Gym. I love you guys. Thanks for all your support. It's been amazing that this message is getting around and sure hope we're helping you. Let's let's quit thinking about this guy and let's all start thinking positively, okay? Please. This does not have to kill us. And I know there's a certain amount of people that it will, but I just have to believe in my heart that if we were more educated regarding pulmonary anatomy, pulmonary physiology, pulmonary radiology, pulmonary physiotherapy, which is, you know, the, and the breathing exercises, that uh, we're smarter than this virus. Let's just cough him gone. Let's expose him to an air environment. He clearly does not like air environments. He only lives in those for 30 minutes. He can live in liquid for weeks, probably. That's why they put him in those liquid environments to study for vaccines, okay? Y'all have a good day. I'm sorry, this was a very long-winded one. I just had a lot to cover. If it's confusing, don't feel bad. I was confused a lot in medical school. I'm confused a lot now. I mean, this is very overwhelming. You've heard a lot of information about the virus, and now you're hearing all this information about the lung. I'm trying to send you through medical school so you can be your own advocate, so you can take care of yourself and you can take care of your family because the healthcare system is currently absolutely overwhelmed with the way that curve has really spiked up. There's just too many people getting too sick too fast. So maybe we can, okay, so they all got it, but maybe they don't have to get too sick too fast. Maybe you guys can start on it right now. And yeah, they'll be nauseated. One of the other byproducts is I'm getting diarrhea. But you know what? Every time I get up from the toilet after my diarrhea, <laughs> I say bye-bye, bat crap. Because, I mean, the bat, bat virus is really, it doesn't make any sense for it to want to live in a human being. Okay, let's, let's not let that happen. Cough it up. These exercises really work. They really work, okay? You'll feel so much better. You'll feel clear-headed. You won't feel heavy in the chest. You won't feel... It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And do keep yourself hydrated. We don't want to get a kidney stone from the guanfacine, the Robitussin mucinex. Keep yourself well hydrated, okay? Y'all have a good day. I don't know if I'll be doing one tomorrow because this is such a marathon. I think you might want to watch it a few times, all right? Love you guys. Bye.